Welcome to Cartoonist Kayfabe. This is Wizard Magazine 30, February 1994. My name is Jim Rugg. I'm Ed Piscor. And we start out with a Beavis and Butthead MTV cover. So awesome, man. Uh, I wonder if Rick Parker drew this because he 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 drew the um he drew the comic and man it it takes me back because <laughs> and all of the uh promotional material, all the all the merchandising that was done with Beavis and Butthead, they couldn't clear Metallica and A C D C so it was always skull and <laughs> death rock. <laughs> I never noticed that. That's great. Yeah. Pretty unusual cover choice. Gare will acknowledge that in his uh, in his letter. He will. Uh, the ad here is Ultraverse Origins Month, and I mention it only because I think that's a decent gimmick. You know, I rag on a lot of these publishers and startup universes. I'm not a big fan of Malibu or Ultraverse in particular, but if you're going to do a gimmick to me, that, that one makes sense. I can see that fans might be interested in that. It's a good starting point, so past the number one issue launches, this is almost like a second wave of number ones in terms of, like, Good place to start, guys. Yeah. What do they say about polishing turds? <laughs> Very true. Marvel Vision ad. I want to point out Nightwatch because it is very, very Spawn-like. And if you ever see an issue of this and, and give it a flip through, I don't believe it is the art team that they say it is that says Ron Lim and Al Milgram, but I think it's someone else, and he's very much a McFarland kind of style. Many issues ago, we talked about like guys who were influenced by McFarland. Um, that's one to, to give a look if you're going through dollar bins and find it. Letter from our publisher. Garib talks about Wizard 28 having the Simpsons cover, and now we're having Beavis and Butthead on issue 30. Says, you know, possibly reaching out to some new readers. Try to attract new readers to the comic book industry. Is that a sign of the uh, pending comics apocalypse? It's a, it's definitely a sign of Garib's business strategy just as a, as a human being. Because, you know, he, he comes into comics when, when it's at its height of popularity. And he's done a million parlays. Uh, outside of that, and was you know I've read read articles that promoted his um, ability to be able to like latch onto the eighteen to thirty five year old male demographic. <laughs> so if, if Beavis and Butthead, if, if Beavis and Butthead doesn't strike that chord, then nothing does. There's a brief uh, paragraph about next issue. As often is the case, next issue though is about the Legend guys, yeah. Miller, John Byrne, Mignola, all those guys. That's an issue I'm super excited for, so he gives that one a, a brief plug. Interesting letters uh, here, because we actually have uh, letters from people in the biz. It's not just Mark talk. Yeah, the very first one, Steve Masarski, the head guy at Valiant Comics, publisher of Valiant Comics, refuting some claims Barry Windsor Smith made. Pretty respectful. He's not really uh, throwing Windsor Smith under the bus, but just saying he didn't think all of Windsor Smith's comments were on the level and that he's not sure he ever wanted to, to enter that, that agreement that they were trying to negotiate for a year. Yeah, total middle management speak, uh, towing the line and all of that. John Byrne, uh, I guess rebutting some McFarlane uh, ego columns from, from a previous issue. And this is ridiculous. He takes... McFarlane had an anecdote or an a analogy or a metaphor. I don't think it was a homily. <laughs> about uh, a shoe store and, and and how how can other cartoonists be complaining if you know would another shoe store complain if a shoe store did business differently or poorly or whatever john byrne spends about 800 words here explaining why that metaphor falls short and it should be a shoe manufacturer not a shoe store very ridiculous this column or, or this letter reminded me a lot of like dave sim there's a certain uh, rhetorical type of writing on display here Kind of weird. Not, not, not endearing me to John Byrne. Um, and then finally, a letter from Richard Peeney, who had been publisher or is publisher of Warp Graphics, but was published in Corin Colleen Doran's A Distant Soil, which was covered in a Palmer's Picks. They had some dispute when she left Warp, and so he's kind of setting the record straight. Disputing some of her claims. He is. And the way that he heard about uh, what Colleen Duran said and this is the first time I've seen it in the magazine, is he received a piece of electronic mail. Yes, I wrote down electronic mail too, Ed. That's awesome. <laughs> Richard Peeney, older than me. 
<laughs> yes, and he was hip. Hip, uh, you know, he must have had some of that option money and spent it on a big ass computer, man. Because it's even before Windows ninety five when everybody got computers. But uh, there's not even an email address for like Patrick McCollum or anybody yet, and, and we haven't seen. I'm keeping my eyes out for the first URL. Yes. When we uh, go through these things, and there will be certain things in the future where um, there will be submission guidelines and have like websites, and that's going to be fun to talk about. Yeah, my note on all of this is uh, it's like TCJ's blood and thunder. All these pros writing in and, and yelling about past articles. Yeah. Always fun looking at the letter art. Those are, I like all four of those. Yeah, I do too. And I'm surprised that uh, Rob didn't poach this guy right here because <laughs> because names would appear in Wizard Magazine and then five months later, they're in Extreme Studios. This is fun. An open apology to the creative community. So this is about the souvenir program from Comic Fest 93, which had like a 100-page coverage in the last issue. And they said due to extremely tight time constraints, um, there was an editorial oversight. That's such bullshit. They too. don't say what the oversight is. So we did some snooping. And the oversight is the guests were all graded, given letter grades, I guess in terms of popularity. And that was not removed from the program. <laughs> so... <laughs> be interesting to see who the c-listers are on that program yeah that's fucking awesome i think there was even a d-lister yeah there, there probably were <laughs> <laughs> here we go stop the presses wizard news plat goes to image there it is man the watershed moment this is the shot across the bow this is the moment where uh little eddie is like i'm gonna grow up and become a cartoonist and put a million fucking lines in my drawings Stephen platt talks so he goes from being the hottest guy in the industry virtually overnight whenever he takes over Moon Knight. Uh, last couple issues, we've seen the Moon Knight issues that he draw on the uh, top 10 hot comics list. Basically out of nowhere, like literally that's his first published work. Moon Knight's wrapping up. It's a, it's a book on the, on the cancellation list no matter how many copies that last one sells off of Stephen Platt. And so he's supposed to go to Cable, which would have been awesome. Rob Liefeld moves in, swoops in, and scoops him over to Image to do profit. Dodge Viper is, is what it took, from, from what I hear, man. <laughs> Before we go from there, man, I just have to show some some of my Steve Platt-inspired young adolescent artwork. Like, look at all those lines, man, that have no meaning or, or anything <laughs> like that. But it's just like, I just saw that all over Steve's work. And, like, look at the foreshortening on that hand, too. Very and some strong. headgear. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> Right in line with what we're seeing here, by the way. Pretty much. This is clear. Yeah, his art is... is uh, it, it feels like the top of that certain image noodling kind of style. It's impossible for me to picture more rendering, more muscles, more shell casings, more of anything than what Stephen Platt brings to the table. I am glad that Image scooped him up because he is he is an Image cartoonist. Absolutely. Supernova, man. He, he burned, burned brightly for a very, very short amount of time. Yes. Cry for Dawn splits. This is cool. Um, we, are, we are getting out of the Image era. Like, Image is established and all that, so that's where the coverage has been. And we are slowly moving toward the Bad Girl era of 1990s comics. And uh, this little piece actually answers some things for me because uh, jo Joseph Michael Lindsner, artist on Cry for Dawn, um, eventually the comic will come back be called Do just Dawn or whatever. To me, Cry for Dawn is an amazing title. It's like very evocative to me for some reason. And I always wondered, like, why didn't you just keep that going on? Turns out he was in business with, I guess, the writer at the time, Joe Monks. And by the way, uh, I don't I don't have any uh, Cry for Dawns in my collection, but I think it very comfortably sits in there with a Faust and like the Crow and like the outlaw comics of the nineties. So like the early cry for Dawn is an outlaw comic. Um, but these two guys shared the copyright and it turns out that like Lisner, the way it reads, he got kind of paranoid that the copyrights were in this monk's dude's name. And, uh, just doesn't trust them anymore they don't they're not going to do business anymore and this monks dude is like listen man like you can have the dawn character and you could have that little logo but listeners like nah fuck that here but i think that that business is done later because he listener will be bringing that character back it's going to be very big and it'll have that little eye teardrop mm -hmm. logo thing man so i guess the deal gets made eventually but something i'm going to keep an eye out for uh in our coverage 
there are a lot of um, we'll we'll get a little bit of this in this issue. So like I would say Colleen Dorian and uh, Richard Peeney and, and Warp have a little bit of that where a creator own may own the work, but how do you represent that from a business standpoint? And it seems like they're still working this out. We're going to see a Matt Wagner feature later where he talks about Grendel and separation from Kamiko and how there were legal entanglements there, even though he owned the copyright. But it's uh, it's kind of a muddy, muddy waters, I suppose. You know, like creator ownership was still relatively new to comics and it was a strange arrangement. Like, how do you set that up legally with a publisher, but you still own the work who has what rights um, and it seems like we'll see some of that fighting and, and, and figuring that part out. There are weird things uh, out there still. Like when I hooked up with Fantagraphics and did um, Hip Hop Family Tree, I knew the book was going to be a success. And I get the indicia back because I hand letter that stuff. And the indicia read uh, Hip Hop Family Tree copyright Fantagraphics. And I hit them up like, this doesn't look right to me at all. And they're like, well, it's really this edition, blah, blah, blah. And... um I'm like, okay, that's cool. Like, can you put this edition? Uh, and there might be like one or two other things. Like, I think uh, I looked at some Klaus stuff that said that. But if you look in a um, at least an old magazine issue of Love and Rockets, it says Love and Rockets copyright Fantagraphics, and that's just it, it's weird, you know? Yeah, it's weird to see right. it that way. Yeah, images stuff like for for Street Angel, you know, like we get the indicia from them, and you plug in your names or titles or whatever, and so it's trademark and copyright Street Angel trademark and copyright Brian and me. And then image logos, trademark and copyright image. So um, I think some of that come, you know, probably some of that language comes from these battles and, and trying to figure out, like, how do you represent everybody's interest? Like I said, ushering in the, the bad girl era, um, Harris plans for 1994. They're going to begin a new Vampirella miniseries. And it's we have to call it out because it's this is going to dominate the magazine in about five, six issues, probably. Marvel screen posters. This caught my eye. These are uh, screensavers for a computer program so that, you know, your image doesn't burn onto the screen. Oh, oh, interesting. Yeah, it runs across two pages. So uh, I was looking into it. You get 35 Marvel screen posters to be used as screensavers. Available now at software stores everywhere. Suggested price is about 20 bucks. Interesting. How the world's changed. (laughs) Go back one. Um, This Wizard Looks Back... Uh, article about the sort of litigious nature of the old Captain Marvel. Um, they break it down really nicely, pretty effortlessly uh, here, but it sort of struck me that all of the litigation and early court cases about comparing uh, Captain Marvel with Superman, um, that all finished and ended 1953, and the character disappears for 20 years. I guess I never really thought about it that much, but the character disappears for 20 years before the 1973 series that C.C. Beck then goes and writes and, 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 and draws for um, for DC. And this is kind of a cult... Like, this was, this outsold Superman. Right. And was extremely popular. But then, uh, you know, in, in our day, going to comic conventions and shit... Um, the old timers really looked at this character as like like cult fi- cult character. You know what I'm saying? Like like this thing that they were deprived of for a long time, and they sort of like fantasize about the old adventures of. So like that provided some clarity to me here, um, and also just like sort of exactly how the court cases shook out. Fawcett won a couple of times, but in the end, DC, DC won. The only thing it doesn't get into here is how DC acquired the character. I guess just whenever they won like their $400,000 lawsuit, like they took it easy on a faucet and said, just give us that motherfucking character, bitch. <laughs> Something like that. Exactly. <laughs> Die Hard Talent Search. This is a publisher looking for artists for Captain Africa. I looked Captain Africa up. I found two issues on eBay for about 150 bucks each. So if you're sitting on those from a dollar bin score, might be worth something. Kirby book available. The art of Jack Kirby is is out in the wild by Wyman, something Wyman. Ron Wyman, Ray Wyman Jr.? Ray Wyman Jr. Yeah, man. Blue I, Rose Press. I'm in comics at this point. I'm a fan of comics. I, I got this thing probably as soon as it came out. As you can tell, it's very well read. I have the same exact book, Ed, which is, is interesting to me because I didn't buy a lot of books of this caliber and expense. 
So it's funny that we both came across this. Um, Birthday present. Yeah, mine might have had something like that involved, but Kevin Eastman heavily involved, and this is one of those like early art book monograph type books that I never saw anything like this for cartoonists, so it was like, what is this? This doesn't look like Captain America. What is this? Super inspiring to me. Uh, I knew Kirby's name. I knew his contribution to the history of comics. Uh, to have this document that I can read uh, from his juvenilia up through the early parts of his career, it let me know that this is going to be a possibility in the future for me. I'm going to be able to make comics when I grow up. I just have to draw a bunch. Uh, and one of the most noteworthy things... I always love these covers. Yeah. Genius covers for... 1946. Yeah. Um, the, the stuff, the, the comprehensive back matter that gave, like, his bibliography. Yes. Uh, wow. The, his, his, um, there are, like, averages and shit about, like, his page count. This is, like, his publication timeline. There's a page of... Yeah, I remember looking at this, and, and, you know, stuff blurs together in my memory, so I remember the massive page counts, but not where I found them. If we, if we it's made, amazing. If we made, if we made trading cards, we would have career statistics and shit. So career totals, man. Uh, he drew twenty thousand three hundred eighteen pages of art, six hundred seventy nine pages of layouts, one thousand three hundred eighty five covers, twenty two covers of layout art, and then here's the averages, man. Three hundred seventy six pages each year. 31 pages a month, one page a day, 26 covers a year, 22 covers a, no, 2.2 covers a month. Most pages published in a single year, 1,158 in the year 1962 when Marvel really caught on. That's like three a day. Most pages uh, published in a single month, 142. That's manga amount. Yeah, that's, a, that's wild. And then these are like less sexy. Most covers in a single year, 102 in 1964. Yeah, th this was something that I, I remember clearly <laughs> staggering, still staggering to this day. And and like my the reason it stuck into my mind uh, was because like well I have to mirror that like I have to like try to figure out you know I'm like thirteen or twelve or something I'm like okay well, how do I manipulate my life so I could hit these numbers I think I'm at maybe a thousand pages <laughs> in sixteen years. <laughs> <laughs> I don't have too much here. Uh, Wetworks update. Wet, Wetworks, Wills Portacio, the seventh image founder, supposed to have done Wetworks in October 1992. Now it's scheduled for May 94, and it kind of alludes to uh, you know some personal stuff that, that happened in his life. And then Malibu Comics doing television commercials, and I actually watched some of these are on YouTube. Uh, I guess go out and watch them if you're interested. There's a guy bungee jumping and, and like reading the... Uh, whatever issue of Ultraverse, and that's when he's excited is when he opens that comic book, not whenever he's bungee jumping. Very 90s. Very X Games. Yes. Very, very 90s. Very X Games. Very MTV. But promoting comics, you know, trying to reach that wider audience. Um, it has some guys, one of the commercials has some guys waking up and getting off their couch looking for something to do, go to the comic book store, lines out the door because of the new Ultraverse titles. Unfamiliar, familiar faces. The Ed by Patrick Daniel O'Neill. <sighs> We crap on Patrick Daniel O'Neill a lot. I can never tell anymore when he's being serious and when he's trying to kind of poke the bear. This one is a... He's disgruntled at the way characters are changing. Guys like Green Lanterns, Hal Jordan, Professor X. Um, they're just behaving in ways that he thinks is inconsistent with their 30 years history as characters. I, I don't disagree with that. You know, I, I can see kind of where he's coming from. You know, one of the reasons a character like Cable is so popular is because he has a different ideology than Professor X. So if you then move Professor X towards Cable, eh, why do that? Bring in your new character if you think you have a better, a better point of view there. Yeah, I guess. I decided I don't like this Speak Up article. This is a lot of uh, filler, for the most part. In every issue. Yeah, it's it's not too impressive. I pulled out a couple of pieces from this. Um, what would you give new readers? What comics would you give new readers? I don't think they're great answers, but one of the answers is X-Men 94 to 145. That's a tall order for a new reader to, to plow through. Um, Elf Quest, Daredevil by Frank Miller, Sandman by Neil Gaiman, and Cerebus. So kind of some interesting ideas in there. I've, I've uh, 
often thought about Frank Miller Daredevils versus the X-Men because the X-Men, you know, so celebrated from that era, but I do think they don't read great. You know, there, there's a clunkiness, there's a period uh, component to the way those are written, and I don't find that in Daredevil. I feel like Daredevil is very much this ahead of its time in a way yeah like the, the way you read the frank miller daredevils there's just one page in each issue that you just skim out you just don't read that page because that's like the jim shooter mandate got to give the daredevil origin page but you throw that page away you have 16 more pages of fun stuff to look at somebody claimed the gen 13 one half issue uh coupon is mis- Ooh. Nice. Yeah, there, there's the coupon, man. For, for uh, I guess, the second one-half issue, like Max was a while back, several issues, and this is going to be, I don't know if it's going to be a regular monthly feature starting now, but in my day, 37 and above, uh, it will be a regular feature every month. Yeah, I think I ordered two of those in my life. I can never Maybe get my sh- three. I don't know if I ordered a Max half, but I did a Savage Dragon, and I did a Sin City one. I can never get my shit together um, to, to like do this but also like one comic in the hand is worth two in the bush and, and uh, with my limited resources I couldn't stand the idea of putting money in a thing sending it off and just like waiting 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 for my comic to show up better just go to Phantom of the Attic and pick something up today this sucks comicdom's newest less than dynamic duo Beavis and Butthead Beavis and Butthead hard, hard to this this is a little bit like Simpsons in that they were so hot, you know, like they sort of arrived at MTV and set the world on fire. We talked about Liquid Television several issues ago, and the biggest rising star, the biggest star to come out of Liquid Television uh, was, was Beavis and Butthead. Uh, you know, Aeon Flux, close second, but I was there, and we were watching the tube the first time Frog Baseball came on, and... In the same way as it was like a running gag on the Beavis and Butthead series where nobody knew the characters' names, Beaver and Butt Lips, that was us. Because it was this real quick thing. We weren't expecting it. It was on. We were dying. And then for like weeks, that was like the chatter at school. Like, yeah, you see that Beaver Butt Brain? Like, (laughs) that, that cartoon that was on Liquid Television? Like, it was this amazing word of mouth thing until it just wasn't and it was like our prayers were answered you know whoever like whatever they looked at arbitron ratings whatever they knew they had a hit on their hands man yeah i'll say and i thought you were going to say the biggest star to come out of all this is mike judge talk about a fascinating career like there are so many people that will have that one hit wonder and beavis and butthead was a huge hit it would have made sense to be a one hit wonder Mike Judge, of course, goes on to do things like Office Space and Idiocracy and currently Silicon Valley and Daria, uh, you know, really an incredible career, like some very high points. Yeah. What this article mentions is that he developed Beavis and Butthead with a $200 do-it-yourself animation kit. And I can remember reading that and being like, we often talk about inspiration. Like, that was a huge one for me. Like, you could you could make it, you could achieve this kind of success with just, like, doing something on your own and doing it at home. His influence cannot be overstated on myself in particular but for the people of my generation for the most part uh, i encourage everybody to listen to the mark Marin interview that mike judge uh did did uh, that Marin conducted with mike judge he gets into a lot of his history and talks about like the animation that he did uh with using this old you know 200 dollars kit or whatever but he also cites a lot of his influences that came from the comic world and it's like you could even look at this and tell that he was pulling from like um, mimi pond and M.K. Brown, the great cartoonist of National Lampoon. Simple line, you don't have to be so ornate, uh, you don't have to have like the most elegant uh, design sense or anything. Keep it simple, stupid. And uh, he did just that. Brilliant guy, like some sort of physicist or some bullshit, but he, he, he knew what to distill in his id to, uh, to connect with people, man. And, uh, and like, you know what? I have this... Uh, We'll see if it shows up good on the camera, because, like, I have my... This is my first sketchbook, dude. Wow. And, in fact, we were so little, like, that, that right there, that's a that's a dart for BB guns, because, cause like, <laughs> cause like, we were uh, super stoked on fucking BB guns when, in, like, fourth grade. <laughs> but, uh, you know, there's a lot of influences here. Like, look, that's, like, Calvin. Yes. Um, But, like, we have some... Be- total beef is a... Bu- like, these are my characters. It's, like, me and my brother. And... It's like the air guitar shit right there. <laughs> and it's like breaking the law, breaking the law. And then there's like in the classroom sequence, there's that one part where, where Butthead like throws the 
the, the, the pencil down and it flies off and hits hits uh, Beavis in the eye. So that's Look at that tangent. Oh, I know. <laughs> and that's uh, and that's like a Daria type character. But then also like this is the one that got me in a little hot water from mom. Because she was you, just like you and Beavis and Butthead. <laughs> yeah, totally. <laughs> she she was just like looking over my shoulder, watching me draw this little thing where he's just like fire, 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 fire. And like my mom did not know the reference and was like, "We have to talk." And also, I didn't see a lighter in the house for like three years. <laughs> she caught, yeah, she's a smoker. She kept that shit on lockdown, man. That's amazing. Oh, oh yeah, check this out, Jimmy. Like, check this guy out right there, man shades and a raider's hat it's like i drew a uh, self-portrait only projected forward like uh you know 30 years or something all you need is the 2099 under there yeah (laughs) you'll be all set (laughs) so the reason for the article is beavis and butthead are coming to comic books pretty genius conceit too it's they're coming to marvel comics no less drawn by the great rick parker yes the great letterer rick parker um did a lot of todd mcfarlane's lettering does everything art-wise in these comics. And as you said, Ed, instead of making fun of music videos, now they're making fun of uh, comic books, comic book characters. Genius. Really yeah, a Marvel smart stuff. adaptation. Rick Parker's cartooning, to me, is the hero in these comics. I agree. Anytime, uh, like, he's, first off, he's really good at, at keeping faithful to the subject ma- to the subject matter whenever he has to draw Beavis and Butthead and shit. But when he's allowed to deviate a little bit, like even look, we recognize this guy from the from the uh, cartoon. He added some fuss and stuff, but this is the only angle fucking Mike Judge ever drew, him, man. So when you have to start getting different angles, like look, that's just a Rick Parker drawing. That's just a Rick Parker drawing, and then you get you get that front view that he probably <laughs> light boxed or whatever. That's probably what all this is like, just like light boxing <laughs> to get the perfect uh, get that sawed off double barrel shotgun. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Yeah, he just fills this stuff with uh, what what Bill Elder would call chicken fat. Just all these details for the eyes. P- looks like he's having a good time doing it. I think he comes from uh, SVA um, and and was taught by uh, Harvey Kurtzman, so that might have some some influence there. This was probably one of my favorite pieces, man. Like like I would I would buy this page if I could find it. I love that lettering. I always wonder what he's done with these pages if they're around. Because this this series ran for twenty five issues it, or something. Like it's it's a long run. It's a lot of pages. It was very popular That's too. That's true. Man. Yeah. Like, like uh, he probably could have made a mint selling these fucking pages. Yeah, he was probably selling these at what would have been a high rate back then, and just unloading them as fast as he was willing to part with them. Probably. Yeah, like look at this. Like, how would you not cut promos on fucking Wonder Man <laughs> comics? Like, of course, <laughs> right. <laughs> Yeah, this is this is stellar stuff, and uh, this is one of those uh, series that I think about like binding. Like this gorgeous. would be an am- am- amazing like two inch thick hardcover. Gorgeous fucking letter, just gorgeous cartooning, man. Yeah. Wow. So they this is this is one of those rare instances where you get a licensed property. You could mail this in. It'd be very easy to draw the crude Beavis butthead style and, and, and kind of just slap these out. But instead, you get a guy giving just A, A-plus effort on these and making comics that I find memorable now. And this is like how most of you out there like know Rick Parker's cartooning from the bullpen bulletins, uh, editorial illustrations of the, the bullseye cartoon sh- uh, cartoon series that he would do where he's just kind of cutting promos on uh, to- uh, Tom DeFalco who was the editor-in-chief <laughs> at the time yeah great stuff like we said it runs for a long time becomes a hot book initially oh yeah it's going to be in the top tens I think uh, for a little while and and uh, like before we put on the cameras like I was marveling that you had I'd never seen an issue one before I have issue two through you know 20 or whatever yeah, I don't have quite a complete run, but these are books that I find in 50-cent bins, dollar bins. Um, I probably found that, that number one in a dollar bin somewhere. Uh, so they're out there. You know, this, this was when comics were still had a decent print run, and you, know, you may find those in back-issue bins. Don't shy away from them. Grab those whenever you come across them at a decent price. Yeah, they're at least beautiful to look at. Um, one note that I missed on Mike Judge and whenever this was picked up by MTV, because they have some stuff from, like, I guess the producer or whoever, you know, shepherded this into MTV's fold. 
And he says that the uh, artistic crudity was something that the producer wanted to keep. You know, like these looked like something a 14-year-old would draw. I think that's part of their appeal, oh, you know, especially as a kid watching it. Like it made sense. For sure. Uh, it, it, aesthetically, it, 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 it works great with the subject matter. But it's not, it's not awful, you know? Like it works. Yeah, definitely. It's very distinct for sure. And uh, King of the Hill, another thing that Mike Judge went on to do. So it definitely connected with an audience uh, as, as his work has continued to do through several projects. The writer, Mike Lackey, he draws the comic. Uh, his writing process is that he draws the comic out on Marvel boards to send to MTV for approval. So it's kind of like a very rough uh, drawing so they can picture what he's doing. He said he tried writing it in a more traditional way, and it just it just doesn't make sense. <laughs> like most of these are kind of character-driven, sight-gag type things, and it was just very weird to like describe them sitting on a couch <laughs> as opposed to just roughing it out in, in kind of a drawn script form. What a headache. I went to school with, uh, like, one of my best friends was basically uh, just just totally uh, Beavis. I had a Beavis friend as well. And uh, and he drove an El Camino, and his name was Means, so we called him El Caminzo. <laughs> That's great, man. My dude was just named Jeff, and, and he <laughs> played with fire a lot. <laughs> <laughs> this dude, one time we were all camping, and we would just have, like, uh, our sleeping bags around a fire threw an m80 into the fire and we're all just kind of hanging out not really paying attention it's like what what was that it didn't say anything <laughs> bad real bad i got i got another one a jeff one because like like this is where our disparities in our ages like <laughs> plays a part because you were a teenager probably and i i'm going to sixth grade i'm very young and i had rap records and you would hear that term suck my dick and shit and it was like a pejorative like i don't like you suck my dick bitch and i was over at jeff's house and he was his mom went out to uh to to, to go grocery shopping and he was like dude you gotta check this out went to his mom's bedroom and like opened up her like underwear drawer and he pulled out polaroids of uh, jeff was a white dude uh and so was his dad uh but put out polaroids of his his mom with a big black dick in her mouth man and i was like whoa so suck my dick is for real like that really happens in real life <laughs> and i was like 11 <laughs> <laughs> that's how you create a beavis in this world man. i guess so yeah yeah <laughs> <laughs> paying homage so we get a profile here of mark silvestri who at the time was part of uh the homage studios jim lee wills Portacio. Um, several others. This was always weird to me. Uh, Scott Williams, I should say, too, was, was part of what I think of as that group. Yeah. Um, they separate, I guess, at some point. I, I never thought of Mark Silvestri as kind of part of that gang. I think it might have just been for a short time when Image was first formed. Maybe they all got together and shared studio space. I thought the same thing, <clears> too. <throat> but then in the body of this article, um, it'll, it'll mention that, like, you know, running two businesses and, and calls Homage Studios, like, one of those businesses so i guess if you were part of like you gotta gotta put in some put in some money to to, to like feed the thing you know like he's part of it and then you would see little call outs in his artwork because there'll be like a window that would say oh, homage and and little characters with hats and shit but then you're gonna start seeing top cow yeah and also like homage what i always associate with jim lee yeah and their stuff would be like the trademark copyright would be like Aegis Entertainment. Yeah. And then becomes Wild Storm. So I, I don't know all the all the peculiarities of like how that all worked. But I do think like you would see Scott Williams inking some of Silvestri at this stage. And it was a very big departure from like Dan Green who was inking him on X-Men and Wolverine. And who I would always associate when I think of Mark Silvestri and was so excited whenever he was going to Image. He was. It's funny like... The ranking of who I was excited for in Image, and then like how they ranked after their first books came out. Classic. Uh, he was very high up before his books came out. Classic case of dumb down for your audience, double your dollars, man. Because you and I have these feelings about Silvestri, but he must have did really well because Top Shelf becomes a thing. I mean, excuse me, uh, Top Cow becomes a thing, and his hit basically comes sort of after I, I don't even know if he drew a page of witchblade you know i know he drew covers and designed a thing and owns the thing but that would be like his his big hit but if you've seen like the x-men stuff inked by dan green especially on those bi-weekly issues for that and wolverine sublime shit and and just like to take a quick look at some super early stuff man a king conan comic from like 1982 or three the guy has some good storytelling chops and you're seeing that the dude's really going for it like he has 
the ability to tell a story and to be clear and to communicate thoughts and ideas. But when that uh, Jim Lee style really connects, he just he just goes in that direction. He just pivots and goes in that direction. And uh, the the books for me were just like devoid of any any storytelling stuff. Like it was just a pretty drawing. Yeah, know? he was a guy. Whenever people like Eric Larson and John Byrne would be for whatever in the in the Savage Dragon letter columns, whenever they were defending like quality of art by image artists, Silvestri is the guy that you would hold up. Like, he was the guy who drew the best of the Image guys. It seemed like that was the consensus amongst Image. And, I mean, you know, I was a big fan of that. But he definitely, it feels like he he forms, as you say, Ed, it's almost later in the process he starts to figure out the hits, the stuff that uh, audiences are responding to in his work as he moves towards Witchblade and, and maybe Darkness and away from something like Cyberforce. And I brought a couple of the early Cyberforce issues to, uh, to kind of flip through and, and maybe make a case for this. Um, obligatory pit crossover. I think every image creator had a had a crack at pit. Yeah, he's he's like he's like the image uh, Spider Man. You know, like you gotta have you gotta have Spider Man show up in issue three of any new series. So here he's he's inking himself in these issues, and you're sort of in between the say Scott Williams and Dan Green. Pretty good spot. I like this spot. You get to see some of his big uh, on 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 uh, display of like that image splash page style. But it seemed to me that he had a lighter cartoony tone maybe aimed at a younger audience in the very beginning like he would have these characters that were you know split splits craig right it's it's i don't think it's a conjoined twin exactly but it's like a character that's fused together in some parts you know reminds me a lot of eric larson's savage dragon stuff and i really enjoyed that it was a uh, a more cartoonish sort of version of mark silvestri and then as the series goes on it moves into a more I don't know if serious is the right word. As, as uh, Sam Keith says, you know, if serious or, or dark doesn't necessarily mean mature. But I love this kind of stuff where it was just very cartoony characters. And some of these have figures, which is pretty fun. Doesn't get into too much uh, in this in this article. Uh, one thing that uh, I made note of is that he pulled in an editor from Marvel. Usually, you know, like when... when uh, Rob Liefeld is buying Stephen Platt for the price of a Dodge Viper. Uh, Silvestri is addressing the popular complaint that these books are unreadable and that they are not coming out at a frequency that was promised. So he got this guy named uh, David Wool from Marvel to work as editor and almost, in a way, as, as, as publisher in a certain way because he talks about in the article that Wall would be like, hey, yo, Mark, where's my pages? It's this weird accountability thing, but you, you see it in, it works in sports where, you know, the manager, the Bobby Knight, would not make a fraction of what a star player would make, but they still have major respect and listen to the guy. Like, it, it's kind of like that. Yeah, and Silvestri talks... The struggles of Image, their first year, their second year, uh, obviously late books was the story with Image, but he breaks it down in like, I have to, you know, I'm doing all of these things, and then maybe if I have time, I get to draw a little bit, and so that's what the editor really, you know, is, is like, here's some responsibility, editor, you do the scheduling, because it wasn't just Mark Silvestri, at this point, he's got a couple of spinoff books too, so you really do need somebody that's able to take that away from the artist, if the artist is going to actually produce any artwork. We... We, as cartoonists, we get 1099 forms, which means we run our own businesses. And the first major step of running a business is to know when, where, and how to delegate some of the later duties so that you can maintain the prime directive, the thing that, that gets you the income anyhow. And sometimes spending a little money uh, on somebody to, to handle that kind of claptrap just gets you way more time to produce the next thing that's going to bring in major, you know, it's going to pay dividends. The last bit that I found fun in this profile mm -hmm. is his origin of how he broke into the industry. Really great. Um, everybody has a different story for how they get in. This one is not one you hear often, at least not that is successful in the end. He went to some show. There was an editor, Joe Orlando, was reviewing portfolios, I guess for DC Comics. Yes. And, uh, the line was too long, you know, like eventually they they had to shut it down end of the day or whatever. Mark Silvestri's brother drags Mark Silvestri to jo Joe Orlando's hotel room after hours with his portfolio under his arm, bangs on the door, basically forces their way in to, uh, to review the portfolio. 
does lead to some work. So uh, I wouldn't advocate that as, as how to conduct yourself at a show, but it is fun to see these stories of uh, breaking in. It is. Uh, it does sound like there's a little kayfabe to it. So, Probably. So when we have the Mark Silvestri shoot interview, we're <laughs> going to keep this in mind. <laughs> Sounds right. This is fun, a little checklist of some of the earlier books. And when you take a look at it like this, not that much, you know? Like, uh, when you look at the n amount of X-Men stuff, it left such a major impression on me. It's not that much stuff. You know? Yeah, I wonder uh, wonder how that run compares to a Jim Lee. Because uh, Jim Lee's another guy that didn't, you know, it, 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 it's a big... It's a big legacy, but it's not necessarily a big number of issues. Ed, you, of course, have gone through this run of X-Men. Yeah. I wonder how you, where you rank Mark Silvestri, an X-Men artist. He was the artist on X-Men when I started reading comics and me started too. reading X-Men, and I loved it. Yeah, me too. Um, but, you know, there could be some bias that that was my entry point. So I wonder, like, having gone through the X-Men closely, where do you feel he ranks? He's pretty high. I, like, of course, the the, the hallmark, the, the number one, the canon is, is the burn austin claremont stuff man he's pretty high up there and uh one of the things i like a lot about the work is some really beautiful cinematic storytelling uh, i don't remember which issue but there's this one uh sequence and he would he would provide himself the opportunity to probably working marvel method to like have a lot of these little set pieces and, and sequences but there's this one where it's uh it's it's rogue stopping a train and You've never seen a sequence of Superman stopping a train as good as this, like, four or five panel sequence that Silvestri put together, man. Um, so Dan Green makes him sing. Uh, I think that um, this was an era where uh, he was probably not tasked with with um, doing the tightest of pencils so that Dan Green could get it go in there and, and add some of, some of his stuff. So I really look at the storytelling of those issues. And he was very thoughtful in his approach yeah i i love that team i still do when i go back and revisit it so glad to hear it, it, it holds up in your assessment too yeah like of course x-men was was the top dog but like uh do you i i never really read the um the wolverine issues like do they stand up do you dig those yeah it's beautiful it feels like he probably has more time i'm always under the impression that x-men was a tough book to draw because so many characters bi-weekly although i think wolverine may have gone bi-weekly yeah. too but it, it felt like uh, there was more room to breathe, and in a way, his art went up a, a notch on the Wolverine stuff. Larry Hammer, writer. That's that's a good run. There's some fun stuff in there, um, for sure. The X Men stuff. I used to, you know, I would copy comics at that time, and I always loved his figure drawing. He would have sort of these smaller legs that it just worked really well with, uh, certainly with some of the characters. He draws my favorite like female X Men. Yes. Yeah, he which kind of makes sense when you think about. I think of him as, you know, Witchblade and, and, and Beautiful Women as being his, uh, what he's known for, what he's become really successful for. So it kind of makes sense that he was drawing good looking ex women. He also draws that issue, I think it's two, uh, 244. Is, is he the guy? Uh the, the first appearance. Yeah, 244, the first appearance of Jubilee. When they're like at the, at the mall, and I, th or there might be like some bachelorette party or something for Madeline Pryor. And when there's Chip and Dale dancers, he draws, uh, <laughs> Uh, Patrick Swayze from Saturday Night Live, <laughs> like with the little dicky on his yes. neck and all that. Nice. Yeah, it's real good. Look, look close. You'll find him. He also draws that one Wolverine with the ass. With yes. The cowboy hat. The Grant Morrison run. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So like, so like when I I never got the Patrick Swayze reference to start, and I'm like, that looks homoerotic. And then th there's that uh, that Wolverine, and it's like, yeah, man, <laughs> that adds to it. Len Kaminsky, the writer of Iron Man at this time, profile on what he's doing with Iron Man. Yeah, Jimmy, uh, I'm going to confess and say that like when we go through future wizards and stuff and we come up to with like like jo jobber shit of this caliber, like I I can't waste my time with it. <laughs> I'm sorry, man. Did you yeah. pull that damn thing? I didn't pull a lot. Um the the biggest note I pulled from it, he he's talking about Iron Man and trying to, you know, what makes Iron Man interesting? How can he make Iron Man in interesting? And there's some different stuff that he plans to do with Stark and his business. But he talks about, like, what would possess a guy who's so successful as Tony Stark and smart and, and, you know, has all this stuff going on to put on the costume. And he doesn't come out and say it, but it's it's an addictive personality, which is in line with Stark's history as an alcoholic. 
And I think that's kind of an interesting thing to explore for a character because it is pretty, diff- you know, I don't, I wouldn't say that about Peter Parker or, you know, Bruce Wayne or most characters. It is kind of unique to Tony Stark. Yeah. And, and, uh, you could see real, real life examples of these kind of people. Like there's like that guy, Dan Bilzerian, who, who's like, uh, from dynastic wealth, had a real rich dad and he's just a big time rich dude and does steroids, gets super gigantic muscles and, and, uh, shoots crazy gun. Like, you know what I mean? Like just like a rich kid. I just heard an interview with Nicolas Cage, and it's it's he's pretty self aware, and he was saying he has to work a lot. Like if he doesn't, he, he sort of gets in trouble. You know, he takes better care of himself if he's working. He needs that structure. He needs that full schedule. And some people are like that. I feel like I might be like that. I, I, I work I was, a lot. Yeah, and I, you know, got to got to stay engaged. Um, do you ever read Clandestine? I meant to ask you about this. Yeah, it's that, about dead heroes that come back and Alan Davis. Yeah, that ad was in the uh, last issue and it crossed my mind. I, I have several issues and I like it uh, okay, but it it has its following. Like, people who read Clandestine, like, really fucking love it. It seems cool. Like, Alan Davis, that sounds good. And then dead heroes from the 60s that have come back, that sounds like a cool, uh, a cool idea. Yeah, you can find these in the quarter bin, and uh, they're totally readable, but, you know, it's not going to stick with you for too long. It's uh, popcorn. Popcorn reading. How about this drawing board feature? Like, everybody looks awesome in There's this. some A-game on, this, on display here. That could be the cover to an Air Cell Warlock comic, Warlock 5 comic. Yeah, that guy must have gotten work after this, right? It's great stuff. The, the Roger great, Paris, man. Where great, you at? great grandson of Charles Paris, the uh, awesome <laughs> uh, Batman inker. <laughs> Could be. Yeah, and to this, me, this one is another one. It looks like this looks like the painted art that was co- that becomes so popular with the Marvel cards and various covers and stuff of this era. Totally, like I, I, they had to just flip a coin, man, to who was going to be the first first placer because that's fucking dope. Yeah. <laughs> nice and conceptual. It, it, he actually really did capture uh, McFarlane's eye. I think that looks like his eye. That is such a great drawing, though. It's like <laughs> with the Spawn mask and Todd McFarlane. It's you it, couldn't do better. You couldn't do it. You couldn't do a parody that would be better than yeah, that. Yeah, he's got the perm too. <laughs> yeah, it's a good issue for for uh, amateur art. Frank Miller cover on uh, Zorro number one there. All right, man. If you're the editor and you pay, I don't know what Frank Miller cost at the time, and this comes in, how do you feel? Oh, uh, yeah, I'd be fine with that. All right. You wouldn't? I don't know. I don't know. This is kind of what, you know, the direction Miller's art went, but... You would want to probably see that mask a little bit more. Like, I guess as a Zorro piece, it might not work, uh, but I, I like it. Colossus. It's so stupid. It's so stupid. Brutes and Babes, breaking into comics. I notice he doesn't reference going to Joe Orlando's hotel room in the middle of the night, but it is kind of a play-by-play of what to do. Yeah, it's 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 pretty good, and it's it's all it's all here, man. You training, draw a freaking lot. There's a lot of focus on the practical part, not just who do you send the art. Too, which is in here but this beginning stuff is like being honest with yourself being honest when you get feedback as you say drawing a lot the training you got to build those calluses up when you were younger drawing stuff like like listen man when i finished that i was really proud of that i i didn't, couldn't think i could do any better <laughs> you know what i'm saying you got to be honest with yourself <laughs> Seriously, because, like, around that time, like, I was thinking, like, oh, this is awesome. Like, I I was submitting stuff. I submitted stuff to the Extreme Studios talent search. Uh, And I was sad that I didn't get it. You know what I mean? That's delusional. Right. It's delusional. And and you know what? Like, I I had art classes around this time. And those teachers who believe their own hype, they still draw the same way that they did back there in 1993, man. So you got to fucking be hard on yourself and work work your ass off and figure out what you're not learning. And, yeah, and absolutely. And address that, that shit. Yeah, this is a section three here talks about classes and uh, says basically you need to get everything out of those classes that you can, even if it's a class that you may not like. You're still learning things that can be applied to getting better. Right. Like I just, uh, in the past two months, I, I've, I've done a figure drawing class and and 
they're like, okay, today's Conte Crayon time. I never used Conte Crayon. I used them, and I've now used them enough to know that I hate them. <laughs> but I did use uh, charcoal, charcoal for the first time, where you like kind of like make the whole mm-hmm. page gray, and then you do this additive, subtracted thing. I could apply some of that to comics. Oh, uh, for th- sure. There, there's, there's when if, when the story is right, like for the right story, I know the exact style that will correspond with that. So you, you got to do that shit. Um, colleges and art schools. He looks at SVA and at Schubert School, which at the time were the, I guess, most prominent schools offering cartooning uh, classes, majors, and, and kind of discusses what he knows about them. I think he did some time at Schubert School. I don't think he graduated there, but I think he did some time there. Yeah, he did. So uh, has a little more insight into there, talks about portfolios that they look for. Some of this stuff is obviously going to change, um, you know, if you were applying this now. Ideas of, like, working hard and getting everything out of class stands up to the test of time. Some of the details, of course, are different. So you would just check if, if you're applying to a school. Same if you're applying to a publisher. You would see, like, what they're looking for. They usually spell it out very clearly. Stay tuned for episode 44 of Wizard Magazine whenever we... Uh we do the Kubert School feature article that's in there, man, that I read a million times and carried with me, fantasizing, man, when I get out of this high school, I'm going there, man. And these are some publishers that you would send stuff to along with the submission editor name. This is harder to come by nowadays, I think. Uh, submission policies are a little more, sometimes you have to sign releases, Sometimes you need an agent if you're trying to, to, to submit. And, and, you know, it's changed in that now a lot of publishers, you're submitting a proposal for a book as opposed to, I want plugged in on this work for hire job. Right. Uh, the the fun th- yeah, like, and, and uh, what I love is that, is that, uh, like, fanographics and shit is here. Uh, so, <laughs> so, like, you could just imagine, like, dudes sending, like, their Spider-Man pages. Like, their their for hot sample from a couple months ago. <laughs> <laughs> totally. Yeah. So, you know they got deluged with that kind of shit. And it reminded me of, like, when we were, uh, we were at Heroes Con and some dude came up to, like, show me his inking portfolio. And I, I gave him, like, the best advice that I could, like, because I've actually never have done uh, portfolio reviews in any real way. But afterward, I was like, go over there and show that guy. Your uh, your portfolio, man, and it was uh, it was Sammy Harkum, <laughs> and, and like Sammy just stared at me the whole time. <laughs> My favorite quote from this article is, "No one can make you learn; you have to want to do it." I think that's the thing that I take away, like because conversely, nobody can stop you either. If you want this bad enough, you know all those no's, all those rejection letters, all those harsh critiques. They're just fuel. You're going to be working your ass off your whole life, period. And if you can figure out how you can use that time to work on something that's kind of pleasurable to you, you've mastered the game. You've mastered life. And when we talk about those like Malcolm Gladwell 10,000 hours practice and shit, if you're counting the hours, you've lost already. You know what I mean? Like Because it's, it's, it's not... It's not woven into your fabric enough for it to be. There's easier ways to make money. You know what I mean? So that's that's what he's illustrating right there. This is my favorite uh, Defiant ad, probably. <laughs> Backstage at the Mystery Theater. Matt Wagner talking about Sandman Mystery Theater and a little bit about Grendel and Mage. So I guess this is the first real Matt Wagner feature we've seen in, in Wizard. There have been some news items and some uh, books in the Wizard's uh, picks, but I think this is the first full-on feature. And he is doing Sandman Mystery Theater featuring Wesley Dodds, the uh, the Golden Age Sandman character. I'm sure part of this is because Sandman was a... Ho- this is a Vertigo book, so I'm sure part of this is because Sandman, Neil Gaiman's books were so popular. Can we get another another book with Sandman in the title? Um, Wagner discusses how this book came to be, and it starts, according to him, with he wanted to work with Guy Davis, whose work he admired from Baker Street. It makes perfect sense to me. I think Guy Davis is a treasure. Um, and, it, and it seems like uh, Karen Berger or whatever editor he was pitching to at DC felt similarly. You know, Guy Davis was on their radar as well. And so they started talking about different characters that Guy Davis would be interested in, and uh, Sandman kind of grew out of that. Classic, it's a classic career maneuver where you can you build equity 
uh, with the people that you work with based on prior successes. So he had Grendel Batman or Batman Grendel, however you the division of name uh, is on on those books. It was a hit. When you have a hit, s- sell them on another idea, man. They're like they're good. They're going to be a little bit more eager to uh, work with you. So he had some idea that he was going to be able to like make something happen at DC, and it was that thing where he saw Guy Davis's work. Didn't think that Guy Davis um, was kind of getting the shine that he deserved. And so he pitched Guy like, yo, man, let, let me get a who's who of dudes, that of characters you would want to draw. And Sandman is what the guy came back with. And they made it happen because, you know, it's not like Neil Gaiman was going to be able to uh, write four more monthly books on top of Sandman. Uh, he was taking about five to six weeks to put together uh, every every script for Sandman. So that wasn't going to happen. And then we cover a little bit of his experience at Kamiko when they go out of business. His very popular character, Grendel, out of commission for a couple of years while they sort that out. Um, at this point, Grendel's back up and running. Matt Wagner writes a lot of that stuff and works with other artists on that. So he's pretty pretty established at this point as a writer. You know, as you say, turning a hit into more opportunities and, and picking up that Sandman mystery theater. It sounds like a fun book. It's not a book I've read very much of, but it is something of a period piece. And a lot of stuff about period pieces is how does this relate to our times? One of the beauties of Matt Wagner is that he, he was, he's an artist. So when he writes for others, he, he knows the score. So he makes sure to kind of like build some rapport with his, his artists, figure out where their sensibilities are, and sort of caters the narrative toward their strengths it's a smart move when you're in a collaborative union as Mm -hmm. such yeah we've heard a few writers discuss that too few though yeah definitely too few and usually writers who stand out yeah i've read some of the uh kamiko grendel comics certainly the first 12 issues with with the the pander brothers story and 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 i I dug it okay man so like reading this was kind of interesting it actually inspires me to uh to give some more of that stuff a shot um because to me, like growing up in this era, uh, I I missed the boat, so to speak. Like this was this was older people's comics, and there's still a little bit of that inside me. Like when I see Grendel, or it's like, this is for the old metalheads or some shit. So I never really gave it that fair a shake. I met uh, Wagner a couple times, talked to him. Super nice guy. I like his thoughts and philosophies. That was Fender outside. If if you kayfabers just heard that, but. Uh, I'm inspired to, to, to read more of uh, Wagner's writing, actually. Yeah, I'm with you totally, Ed. I came on board when Grendel was on hiatus, mm-hmm. and it, 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 it's hard to figure out where to start. And it was hard, you know, pre-internet, I didn't have a great access to comic book stores. Indie comics were more expensive, so there was kind of these various barriers to entry. But obviously a well-regarded character, uh, interesting in that... A lot of these characters, if they run through Marvel DC, you get a bunch of different artistic interpretations, and I think that's what builds a character. You don't see it as much with creator-owned indie stuff. Grendel's one of those characters that has had that experience. Lots of great artists have, have worked on Grendel at different stages. So, yeah, definitely uh, an innovative cartoonist. Coming out of the indies, huge uh, design influence in his work. Um, just a pretty unique guy in comics, American comics. I have an old issue of Nexus from Capital comics or capital city comics whatever mm-hmm. whatever the original company was called and there's a piece of uh, matt wagner nexus fan art in there before he oh, wow. was a pro yeah i bet it looks good pages. yeah pretty good it's a very striking image and and uh it's not front on so it's like this he he's playing around with anatomy in a very interesting way it's it's a it's a cool image uh i will not be able to dig it up for you in time to put an image i don't think there's uh the, the other piece for matt wagner is always going to be mage his right. other character. Oh, yeah, we so should talks, talk about this. talks about Mage a little bit in here um, and, and working on the second Mage series, which wouldn't come out for a while because he wants to finish some other projects. He doesn't want to be in the middle of something. And it comes out when you and I start hanging out. Uh, but here he's talking about it. It's always meant to be a trilogy. Right. Uh, so, like, Mage, the hero defined, I think, is the, is the second one. And that came out in the aughts. Okay. okay so many years, at least 10 years after this article. But uh, just recently, like, since we started the fucking Kayfabe channel, he finished the trilogy. Yes. And Mage is one of those characters. 
again, a little before my time, uh, that the, the older guys I knew that were into comics, Mage was like this high point of, of really a standout comic. He um, patterns the character after himself. You know, I guess there's veiled autobiography in that to some extent, but uh, readers definitely responded to that character very different than anything else on the stands then, now, you know, in between. Uh, a very unique superhero kind of comic. Yeah, it's, a, it's to, uh, you know, he's a, he's a Joseph Campbell guy. And it pulls from, I guess, Arthurian mythology, and it's the, you know, it's hero's journey. But that just means it's five act, or you know, it's a, it's, it's got a beginning, middle, and ending, really. In the can, five easy steps to creating your own ash can. I love these kind of things. This is basically making mini comics. We saw an ash can article in Heroes Illustrated number one, which would have come out a couple months before this. Obviously, with Brutes and Babes and uh, fan art. That's clearly a popular piece of uh, Wizard, and they recognize that. So this was great for me. There's lots of information about how to make mini comics and zines and digests floating around out there. At the time, uh, Image was releasing these Ashcan editions, I think mostly to make money, maybe for a little bit of promotion that a new book was coming out. But this is um, something I didn't apply right away, unfortunately, but... Ultimately, this is what I started doing when I was making comics in the beginning. Um, this is an example of one of my mini comics. This is Street Angel, which of course goes on to, to be a full-size comic and, and actually a couple of series of comics. But it's the same principle as what they outline. It's photocopied interiors, hand-stapled by me, folded in half. So exactly what they describe here. I got one of these babies myself, man. And, and what I was doing, like I quit my job. And I started making these small strips because every major independent comics publisher had a uh, had an anthology. So I would do these four or five pages, submit them for these anthologies, and be systematically rejected every time. But I put a lot of you know, like I put work into this, you know, and I just didn't want the stuff to go away. Yes, I needed I needed it to be useful in some way. So it ultimately, uh, you know, I would take put this together sell out of them every convention I went to, man. And in fact, using the material in this comic is sort of how I got uh, my first work with Harvey Picar. You know, sent him the comics and, and, and got a gig. It's a nice looking package. Last note on this article, it's by the guys who were doing Ogre. So I thought I'd bring that and we'd do a flip through. This is, I don't know about an outlaw comic. I grouped this in with my 80s black and white self-published books, even though it's a couple years later and it's obviously not black and white. But it's the weird genre kind of stuff just to the left of uh, mainstream. It's almost too good, though. Like, like the and the anatomy is like kind of too on point. Yeah, you can see the, uh, <laughs> the actual process that they're talking about is for this issue. And we mentioned Len Kaminsky, the Iron Man writer. Yeah. He had a letter published couple couple issues ago and i was like oh it's pretty smart you know you can plug your your book i feel like maybe you submit this article in a way to 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 plug and promote your own work because they do have you know they ask for solicitation of article ideas this is a good article i think but it's a smart way to promote your work if, if, if you're the guy writing this article and creating the mini comics or, or the full-size comics i should say palmer's picks We're talking about hate this time jimmy peter bag and uh we said it last week with the Dan Clowes 8-Ball one. There's going to be few misses from uh, Tom Palmer from this point forward because comics is kind of changing. Like, like these independent creators are getting slightly more established and it's yielding more and more new talent coming into the game. And so right here we're talking about Peter Bag. Uh, went to School of Visual Arts with a bunch of good people. Uh, had teach teachers like, uh, like Kurtzman and Will Eisner. And when Kurtzman was a teacher, guys like Robert Crumb would come through, talk to the class. And, and like Drew Friedman and Pete Bag, they would go dumpster diving with uh, Crumb. It makes sense. Like he went to school with fucking John Holmstrom, the guy who created Punk Magazine, the Drew Ramones album cover. So he edited and put together a couple issue, issues of something called, uh, what's it up there, Comical Comics or, or like some, some shit like that. Comical Funnies. Yeah. Three issues of that. That goes away. Too unwieldy. Too much work. Uh, but... They proved that they could make the damn thing happen, and Crumb sort of knew the kid, gave him a tenure as editorship on a Weirdo magazine, and I think we'll do we'll do a Weirdo episode uh, at some point, man, because there's a great oral history book that just came out. We should give that some shine. Yeah, I always 
think of Peter Bag in that weirdo run is remarkable because he seems like such a young cartoonist whenever he takes that over. Yeah. Working with some giants and, and I think editing any anthology is nearly impossible. So for a young guy to take that on is pretty impressive. Yeah. So from the weirdo stuff, uh, the Fantagraphics gives him a call and he starts putting together another magazine uh, style comic in the in the in the vein of like uh, you know the aesthetic of the format of Love and Rockets. We'll say Love and Rockets got got some heat, so that they started Fanta started putting out this stuff. And these, this would be an anthology series of many of his uh, many of his cartoon characters. I guess this one might be like mostly Goon on, on the Moon strips, but then there's Studs Kirby, Kirby Junior. There's the Bradley family. Um, Basically, when you do an anthology like this, you throw things at the wall, you see what sticks. You get you get feedback, you get letters back. This is before the internet, man. So when uh, the feedback is is sort of like leaning in one direction toward the Bradley family and Buddy Bradley in particular, let's 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 cut the line. And uh, the magazine format, nobody's buying that stuff because of the simple shape. It's the, it's the yes. greatest comics. Of that of that era, but fucking dummies at the comic shop just won't buy it because it won't fit into a long box. Like, give me a fucking break, you goddamn idiots. I feel like a lot of uh, Peter Bag people think of him as a, as a really great writer, and sometimes his visual acumen is is you know a distant second. And I don't think it should be like. Neither look at I. that cartooning is absolutely stunning, beautiful. All of his lettering. You know, from ba- a graphic sensibility, like I think this stuff is just amazing, top notch. Yeah, balance black, blacks and whites. Uh, what you said, like really good lettering, uh, very distinct lettering. You could look at that and be like, oh, that's well, that's Peter Bag. Extremely expressive characters. He has developed his complete own language of of comics, which which sounds like what every cartoonist should do, but very few, very do. few do. The the fanographics, like first gen guys. The Los Bros, Klaus, Pete Bag, like they all have their own language of comics, you know. And they, these are these are the model to me. Yes. Um, these people to just like you don't letter, don't letter like Artie Simek, you know what I'm saying? Don't ink like this guy or that guy. Like, fucking uh, you be be who you are. But we're here because hate is a thing now, man. 14 issues uh, to, to date as per uh, this article. And uh, like I said... What a he, great cover on issue one, by the way. Totally. And we need... We need a kid of like the millennial generation to be like Pete Bag was for his generation because he was there in Seattle when Mud Honey... Like, like all those bands and shit were breaking and he wasn't going to suffer any motherfucking fools. So I need like a 24-year-old <laughs> who has... Who's like... Of my cut, cut from my cloth to like really cut promos on what they experience around them because that's what this is right here. Using these characters, like I mean, that's Pete Bag, like dressed. Oh, this is a good issue. Dressed like Fuddy Duddy Buddy Radley, but <laughs> but it's uh the Prisoner of Hate Island. It's um Gary Groth, Kim Thompson, and Pete Bag, and uh, G- uh Gary Groth keeps like b- like blowing shit up. <laughs> and there's this thing where uh, they blow up a toilet, and that really happened at a party. Now, Gary, like, he, I don't know what he was thinking, <laughs> but when they blew up the toilet, it did send shards of porcelain in the air that were raining down for like a minute and a half. <laughs> nobody was hurt. <laughs> nobody was harmed uh, in the in the in that explosion. But uh, there it is, man. The, the thing blew. Um, but that's, that's like what hate is, is just him cutting promos on what he's seeing in his generation. Uh, like, you know, he's synonymous with grunge, as you say, for sure. It, it, to the point where like these guys all had, when, when Gary was selling them or when Fantagraphics was selling them, they were sold with like this, like intense, like artistic ethic and shit like that. But, uh, when Hill's department store was still around and it was back to school era, I could have chosen to get grunge pencils uh, with my Trapper Keeper. Yeah. Drawn by Peter Bag. Yeah, yeah. Love. Again, the graphic sensibility of him is so strong. Like, what a great cover, great logo integration. Looking at even, you know, all these back covers, 
it's a tour de force. You know, it, it, it really is. Like, it stands out. And he must have been more prolific as well. Like, the, the, the number of issues that he produced, you know, looking at neat stuff there, I think... F- 15, no, like, I, yeah, I forget, I think, like, 15 issues. And, and 30 that. issues or so of hate, mm-hmm. like, extremely prolific, um, you know, when you compare him to some of his peers of that generation. But uh, no, no sacrifice in quality or lack of uh, unique voice. One of the few uh, comic book makers who could legitimately make me belly laugh more than once uh like while reading the pages and it had to do with the use of the comic book medium it had to do with page turns and reveals and and uh, oh yeah i mean stuff. you can see when you said he develops his own cartooning language like it's clear you know that that cartoony forms that he uses it's all obvious that, that that's where this is coming from i don't think i'm breaking kayfabe by saying this um i'm quite sure i'm not but there's a character in uh, in Hate, it's Buddy Bradley's friend named Stinky. And Stinky is based on, if you're in Seattle, you could go to the Fantagraphics bookstore. <laughs> and the proprietor, Mr. Larry Reed, is who the Stinky character was based on. I do think he knows that. But we're going to... He does now. We're going we're gonna to take that gamble. <laughs> Um, last thing that uh, Tom Palmer mentions is the letter columns in here. Although I, did I pull an issue that doesn't have a letters <laughs> column? But just the liveliness of the letter columns and, and, and the stuff that, you know, the correspondence and the kind of stuff that is covered in those. I always like, uh, like in 8-Ball, whenever they would draw their merch pages, like a lot of these things would be drawn in. And uh, that hate ball t-shirt, man, I would wear that. Yeah, yeah, it would have been awesome to see those guys on tour. I mythologized that tour, but getting to know uh, Bag and Klaus, they would talk about, like, they, like, would have to sleep in, on the floor <laughs> together and, like, where, where they would sleep. It sounds so bad. Yeah, like, the retailer would be have to, like, walk over them to, like, get to the bathroom at night and shit <laughs> like that. <laughs> oh, man, it sounds like a nightmare, but it's a great name for, like, a combo tour. It, it, it is, man. And, 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 frankly, they did a lot of heavy lifting. Uh, and broke down a lot of barriers and you and I get to just like walk through the doors comfortably and get to get put up in the West and stuff. So, <laughs> so, so I appreciate their contribution to uh, to the history of uh, independent comics and shit. And it's real cool that Pete Bag got the call out here. Uh, also, uh, just personally, like Pete Bag, he put my name in the hat for this animated series thing that happened in like uh, the late 2000s, like 2008, 2009. And uh, in total, I made like 150 G's on that thing that I was able to apply to finishing WYSIWYG and the first volume of Hip Hop Family Tree. I lived on like while while putting those books together. You know what I'm saying, man? So I have to I have I'm hugely in debt. Yeah, it sounds like you owe him a dinner or two. Every time I see him, man, I'm like, dude, I, I will I will paint the picket fence outside <laughs> your house, man. If you if you if you want me to, man, um, this is I like comics. This is a fanzine that he did. Yeah. It's mentioned in this column. So it's a 120-page fanzine featuring interviews with Julie Doucette, Jim Woodring, uh, Dennis Eichhorn, Gary Groth. You know, lots of these cartoonists, alternative cartoonists, luminaries at the time. So um, kind of an interesting object. I don't have that. I've never read it, but uh, happy to happy to learn about it. Yeah, and we know Bruce Chrislip from uh, Going to Space. Yeah, mini comics guy. Uh, so something to keep your eyes peeled for. Yeah, uh, and uh, you know it's a good, good Palmer's picks this issue. They're calling attention to uh, the next issue, man. It's going to be Chester Brown, Yummy Fur, heavy hitters, Ed, as you said. So we'll be back then, toying around. I have very, uh, very little comments on here. This is the Midnight Suns contest winners. Um, pretty good. It's you know make a figure contest. Any standouts to you? Not really. It's fun that the uh, Morbius is posed. Somebody going uh, above and beyond to try to not just make a figure, but stage a photo. Got to appreciate appreciate the uh, presentation. Yeah, maybe you got some ideas there. There's a lot of Instagrams that that, uh, do that. Kids like build uh, dioramas and shit. And I actually do want to call out uh, attention to uh, Kayfabe Lieutenant Punker Mike, who uh, does a lot of that stuff, man. Uh, Kit bashing toys and uh, and building scenes. And he did some cool animated... uh, cartoons like animated intros for us and did uh fake little commercials with the pittsburgh powerhouse uh tag team champions eddie <laughs> p and jim jim rugg so like you know the the culture of that has been around for a long time and and uh it's it's pretty cool to observe it's one of those things that i'm very comfortable like not being a part of but like appreciating from the outside looking in yeah for sure
does the card feature ever go away? Uh-uh. Not, not as far as I can tell, as I remember. Comic Watch. Machine Man number two and Superman number 51. And that's Machine Man number two of four of the Barry Windsor Smith miniseries for the podcast listeners out there. Yeah, and, and team up, not just Barry Windsor Smith, but team up with Herb Trimpey. Yeah, yeah. They yeah. should just have all four issues of this thing featured because uh, pretty pretty fun comic to flip through. Great covers, too. Like, it's slowly building the Machine Man head. The little article piece is real dumb, though, man, because they're like, yeah, I know, Machine Man, he's a sucky, it's, it was a sucky comic, blah, 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 and I take uh, great offense to that. Me too. Specifically, they dissed 2001 A Space Odyssey comic, calling it quote unquote very pathetic these guys are stupid as shit i'll say this this era that was pretty common for like 70s kirby late era kirby stuff was very dismissed by by you know this kind of comic voice yeah, it's probably patrick daniel o'neill that stuff has been reassessed quite a bit now you know i think that stuff is much more highly regarded now than it was at the time and it is patrick daniel o'neill it's this old guard that's looking at the 60s marvel stuff and saying that's the good stuff yeah and this late era stuff's not as good but when I was hearing, hey, Kirby, 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 the only stuff I could afford was that late era stuff. And you could find it in quarter bins at like comic book shows and stuff. And I came to really like it. That was my gateway into Kirby. OMAC, Mike Royer, all of the great stuff that came out of the 70s and late 70s stuff. That was the only thing I could afford to, to look at. And I think part of the reassessment is because there's a generation that that was our Kirby. That was the Kirby we were able to actually take home and read it. And, and so... We've reassessed that now, but this was pretty common at that time period of just trashing that era. And it would be it was just prose, even. Mark Grunewald, uh, you know, Michelle Fife's uh, favorite, favorite uh, comic book <laughs> creator, man, cutting promos on on uh, Kirby whenever, you know, Devil Dinosaur pages are coming into the office and, and people are, like, hanging them up, throwing darts at them and shit. By the way, they're calling... Jack Kirby's 2001 Space Odyssey comic, very pathetic here. The reason that Superman 51 is worth buying is because it starts this little diamond triangle shaped numbering on the covers. <laughs> so fucking dumb. Picks from the Wizard's Hat, X-Men 30. Stop me whenever uh, you, you, you need to talk about one of these, Ed. We've already talked about Beavis and Butthead number one. Nice to see it in front in a feature. Um, surprising they would pull that out, but I'm glad to see it. Yeah, give the cover cover models some shine. Profit number five. We oh. heard about this in Wizard News. Some hot artist is taking over. I don't know how he got from Wizard News to the book release this quickly. I have a feeling this might be an inaccurate release date. Yeah, I think so, man. <laughs> but it's listed here, so I figured we'd do a flip through. April of what year, man? Uh, no, no, no. Uh, uh, this one is April. 94, so cover date, it's only a couple of months behind. My favorite issues of Platt are the ones that he inks himself, and there's only a couple of, the, of profits that he inks himself. This is the first issue he takes over, so he's really going all out. Okay, let me tell you how I always read this splash page until fairly recently when I like reassess the image. This is how I read this image, right? This is trapezius muscles, and the arms are out here, <laughs> and this is just the chest. <laughs> for for. 15 years, 20 years, I read wow. it that way. But it's not. It's his his hands are in this yeah, yeah, gimmick yeah. right here. And that, that's foreshortened uh, arms. But boy, I really thought like the arms are... And that's just breast... And that's just like the sinew and shit of like the... Because that's like a necklace coming down the chest with some, <laughs> like a belt around the waist or something. A lot of veins <laughs> bulging out of those arms. Yeah, you know, like this is a move that you, young artists do, and I've 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 done it as a kid, and I continue to do it. When when you when you figure something out, like why why do it only once if you could do it fifty thousand <laughs> times, man? This is just absurd. I I remember picking this thing up and just being like, "Good lord, so macho, so butch." <laughs> He's in a snowstorm with no shirt on. Because he's a fucking badass, man. Like, <laughs> I've seen this original. You can go on Comic Art Fans and look at this thing. Uh, good luck. Good luck being able to tell Yeah, I wonder if uh, colorist Brian Talman just quit after this issue. It's just, it's just unreal. Just like, 
<laughs> like ruled out like lines of blood just dripping out of fucking dude's mouths. <laughs> I feel like each each page flip gets more ridiculous with the amount of ink Double that's on the bullets, page. Double bullets, fabric tears that he mastered on the Moon Knight cape. <laughs> right? Veins bulging every chance you get. Why Amazing. Put, why put one bullet if you could put 5,000? I can't even tell exactly what's sp- happening here, but it looks like somebody's tied to his arm or something. Like like a uh, dead body or a tortured victim. is, is t- Literally, those are his feet and, and legs awesome. tied around his arms. It's fucking awesome, man. <laughs> wow. Look at that shit. Hottest artist of 1994. This is the book. I don't disagree. Man. I, I only wanted this. Like, whenever there would be any slightly domestic kind of situation and i'm talking about even just like the scientist i want no white lab coats i want dudes in 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 the brush with guns and bandoliers knives and bullets it's just ludicrous (laughs) father what i really like about this by the way too is uh in the in the wizard news piece um his whole impetus for doing profit was to like flesh out the, the Pro, John Prophet as a character. And then you read the, the, this first issue of like his first, and it's like such bullshit, you know? But uh, it also reminded me of like, if you ever listened to that that uh, Christian Bale, whenever he flips out on that guy, and it's like, oh, good for you. Like like all of that. <laughs> uh, when he mea culpa he said that like, you know, I was just in character. It was like part of the movie. I'm, I'm kind of like, a, you know, I'm a, I'm a I'm method actor in a way. And uh, the movie that he was being the method actor for was a fucking Terminator movie. <laughs> I can't tell if he's screaming no or father. <laughs> I think we had enough fun here, Jimmy. Yeah, that's it for Profit 5. That's his biggest run is really on profit. So yeah, and that's 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 good, Stephen Platt, because when he gets an anchor like on uh, profit nine, less interesting. Yeah, rounds off the edges a little bit. Good and cheap, Daredevil one ninety one. This was Frank Miller's last issue of Daredevil for a while until he comes back and writes a couple of issues. Inked by Terry Austin instead of the uh, longtime Klaus Jansen, but also colored by Lynn Varley, which is. Fairly unusual. She doesn't color too many comics. Using the four color process, in fact, which which it, this might be one of her only few. Yeah, and we should say Lynn Varley for anybody not sure at home is the colorist of Legend or of Dark Knight Returns, and uh, you know a huge part of the reason Dark Knight Returns looks the way it is and is kind of considered she uh, has, the way it is. Yeah, also three hundred. She has such a such a command of, of of color like you never see like the jobber colorists of of this era use like a 20 percent yellow for anything like you never see this in print yeah it's true and i loved this issue as a kid because of all the cross hatching such a fan of that and it's very precise and, and different than klaus jansen i didn't realize it at the time but i probably came to this after ronin and i loved all that hatching self-contained story um the like nice complete thing uh, it, it puts it puts a bow on the grim and gritty uh, era. You know, it's it's Daredevil playing uh, Russian roulette with the comatose body or the catatonic body of a bullseye going through kind of like the origin. Uh, very pulpy, very, uh, very uh, Sin City yes. uh, in terms of the writing. Um, you know, purple prose and hy- hyperbolic m- m- macho uh, caption like work. Yeah, pretty, pretty dark stuff. I always like that last page. Of like xeroxing the the one panel and just like blowing it up like hundred hundred percent every every time in and then like the fade in from the eye to the trigger. I always thought that was genius, but just like I would just like fixate on like matching up. Right. Like, okay, there, yeah, yeah, that's definitely there. That's definitely like <laughs> I would do that too. Yeah. Yeah. Anytime it looked like a panel was repeated, it'd be like, was it exactly repeated? Is that a photocopy? And then the final click of the gun. No bullets. Impotent. A lot of impotence in the uh, Frank Miller superhero. <laughs> Listen to Tom Schioli's coverage on our Dark Knight episodes live on our YouTube at this moment. Top 100. I don't have anything insightful to, to say here. No. Spawn, number one, yeah. all the way to issue 19. It's still holding down the number one spot. Pretty the, impressive. Yeah, in the same way uh, that we no longer have... A uh, 
a New York Times bestseller list for graphic novels because it would just be Walking Dead books and Randa Taugemeyer books. <laughs> they took away our favorite part with like the little company where we could see like which companies. It's like, yeah, just figure it out for yourself. Like you'll be able to add up how many Marvel books there are, how many DC books there are. Top ten, couple plat books. Daredevil is is kind of reinvented itself with the return of Elektra. I bet Patrick Daniel O'Neill chose this one right here. The Screen Lantern gimmick. Like, those guys, like, the wizard staff is, like, wholly responsible for, like, Green Lantern having popularity in the 90s, man, because uh, they were on the, this comics jock so much, man. Especially, like, when that Ron Mars guy gets on, on the helm. Like, they freaking jock ride it so much. Only one Valiant book here. Ninjak, Joe K, Joe Quesada. So is the bloom off the Valiant rose at this point? Right, yeah, they they uh they hitched their wagon to, to uh somebody else, man. Somebody paid a little higher for for uh for their um spin zone coverage. <laughs> West Coast Avengers one oh two. That's how you know it's bullshit. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You know it's not bullshit. Stephen Platt makes the top ten list after being in the comic book uh, business for like five months. Yes. Bully for him. The other thing that's not is uh, bone number one, 150 bucks. Some some back issue retailers are reporting. So uh, we've been chronicling bones rise to prominence, and I, I'd say it's on the radars at this point. And that's just going to continue escalating. That I you know I never thought to like take a look on eBay to see what a number one's going for of the original print run. But you would just see like maybe even in this price guide here, uh, there would be like. 10 print runs of issue one, you know? Can I tell a Sean Chen story? Yeah, man, hit it. From, uh, basically when we, we created Cartoonist Kayfabe at the Baltimore Comic Con in, uh, 2018, man, and we were seated right next to, uh, Sean Chen. He was there signing comics, doing commissions and whatnot. Nice guy. And he was there, uh, he's a father. He was there with his little boy. A little boy, how, how would you gauge the age of the boy, man? Six? Nah, maybe a little older. Seven? Eight, maybe. The boy, uh, sat there, had a sketchbook, and was not finicky, sat there the entire time, the entire show, and would just entertain himself and continue drawing. He had a tip jar out, and people were, <laughs> I think, I'll get to it at the end, but but he boy had a tip jar out, and like people were stopping by, like like talking to the little dude, and he just is rocking and kicking ass, man, drawing some really cool stuff. So we all split. They, like the festival is over, man, and everybody's packing up, and 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 Sean is coming over talking to us, man, and and uh, saying our goodbyes and shit, and I'm like. Yeah, your son is awesome, man. Like, his drawings are great. And Sean Chen looked at me and was like, do you think? <laughs> and then he's like, well, I mean, I guess we just have different styles. <laughs> right? Can you vouch for this? This did happen. <laughs> <laughs> I guess we just have different styles. <laughs> Harsh taskmaster, that Sean Chen. But you know what? That's gonna he's gonna breed a, a freaking badass. Yeah, that dude's gonna kid. be like fourteen with the best looking comic on the stand. Straight up. Any uh, back issues you want to look at? I, I took a look in there. No, nothing much really stands out. Um, but we should check out just for my edification. Check out the Miracle Man because it's gonna rise soon. Miracle Man, no activity at this point. Yeah, that's gonna change within about a year, I would say. They have some great covers this issue, though. I think that mask cover is pretty awesome with the giant axe next to him. It's a good drawing. Is that Doug Monk, you think? I guess it is. I, I, that's who I always think of with uh, the mask. When he would draw it, it's great. But sort of when I came around, like there were other people drawing that shit. Wizard exclusive Gen 13 preview. Gen 13's, you know, we talked about Mark Silvestri's uh, breakout book being something like Darkness. In a lot of ways, Gen 13 is the real homage studio Wildstorm breakout book, I think. Yeah, it makes sense. It really kind of carries things on because, like, Wildcats didn't do the trick. Right. You know, it was it was this thing on the strength of um, J. Scott Campbell's art. And I have to tell you, like, the when you, when you close your eyes and you think J. Scott Campbell, it's really not these... Like issue one of Gen no, thirteen, right. it's it might be like issue one of like the regular series of Gen thirteen. He was really ironing out a lot of kinks here. Yeah, but becomes a very distinct style. Beautiful and and uh, boy, that's dark. 
the kid's dad being killed in a silhouette behind him, blood, yeah. blood squirting it's on his face. It's the 90s. Yeah. Um, the, I think what really helped him out, too, uh, was the computer coloring was really getting figured out at that time. Like, it's, it's not figured out here, but, like, whoever did the computer coloring on that regular series, it blended beautifully with, um, with the art there. This is uh, Ego, Todd McFarlane's Everyone's Got Opinions This column. is awesome. <laughs> this is awesome. My note for this is best column ever. So I guess Peter David with George Perez's help, picture of the Hulk and uh, Sax from Sax and Violence, punching Spawn into a wall. I guess this ran in his uh, Comic Buyer's Guide column, but yeah. I digress. Yeah, you can see the masthead right there. So in response to that, uh, that column, Todd McFarlane runs uh, a few pages... I, I guess this is from Comics Buyer's Guide. I'm not sure where this is, but it's a list of ranking of book sales. Spawn 17, number one. A few pages and many books later. Saxon Violins, number two, ranking 179. I believe now we're even. <laughs> <laughs> I believe it was the great Jay-Z who once said, uh, men lie, women lie, numbers don't. <laughs> and, and that's what he's saying right there. It's it's that's a hard one to overcome. Yeah. And then it's just like the order index 220 and it's like 17. Yeah. Eight. B big difference. Um, P.S. to the retailers that he offended whenever he called a bunch of retailers pigs this is earlier. Um, he says it's not all retailers and you can test which ones it is. Go up to your local dealer of comics. Ask them if they've got any Jack Kirby comics. If they say who, then they are pigs. Yeah. And, and once again, the Jay-Z, like we would call them culture vultures. You know what I'm saying? It's people who are looking to strike gold twice. Like when when I was a kid at this era, uh, I bought many of my Extreme Studios books from a place called the Allen Allentown Bakery, which <laughs> sold fucking baked goods and donuts and shit. And they just had a diamond account because of this new hot thing. They didn't know what they were selling me. Uh, they would not know who Jack Kirby is. I was going to ask if you after this column <laughs> if you went and tested them. Wizard Profile, Roger Stern. I've been pretty critical of these Wizard Profiles. Um, I don't get much out of this. And nothing in particular this month. It is fun to see the Max and Pit ad, though, as uh, a two-issue two Pit crossover concludes in issue number eight of the Max. Um, that's kind of the Gen 2 of Image Comics right there. What I, I've been studying Sam Keith a lot lately, and what I really dig is he can reasonably light the form of like form but when you can like light a form but still maintain like card tartuni like that's like a part of it like so he has like under there's full um like he knows the underlying structure of these forms that he's drawn even though they're distorted and stuff so with that strong foundation he can then light it and then that's that's how you get like this kind of cool shit man like i've been looking at this stuff a lot to just try to like deconstruct it a little bit maybe try to like in, inject a little bit of that into my shit because i look at him i look at hewlett and 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 it's like it's not right yes but it's fucking fun it's cool you know pathologically cool uh they can't he can't not be cool with his art and it's like why wouldn't everybody want to add a little of that to their system i'm with you 100 percent. i love that cartoony interjection and, and not everybody has it but i welcome it so that concludes Wizard number 30. Next week, man, am I excited for this one. Wizard 31, this is one of uh, probably the issues that I read the most closely. So yeah, it'd be fun is, to revisit this, this one. This is before my time, man. But uh, beyond the legend, look at that masthead, man. Bisley and Eric Larson. This is the fucking G uh, Jim Rugg issue if there ever was one. This totally is the Jim Rugg issue, and this is possibly the Jim Rugg exit issue. I'm not sure how many issues I bought after this one, but this is, when I owned only one wizard after I got rid of everything, this is the wizard I own. That's cool, man. You guys are not going to want to miss this next show, man. So in the meantime, if you haven't done so already, subscribe to the channel, hit the bell icon, like, follow, uh, share the YouTube URL across the web. Uh, we'll notify you whenever we have new vids available. You can pick up Cartoonist Cafe merchandise at our spread shop. There's a link below the video to that. Jim and I just started working on some new comics, so you guys know what your marching orders are in the meantime. Read more comics.